Okay, so uh, we'll make a start. So welcome everyone to panel number 10 of the Electoral Integrity Conference of 2023, where we're looking at technology and elections, threats and opportunities. Uh, and this is obviously a panel which follows on very nicely from the discussion that, was, that took place yesterday, where we have had a round table uh, organized by IFAS that looked at some of the challenges that can be involved when we implement technology into elections. Uh, technology offers us lots of things in many in all aspects of our lives, but particularly in terms of elections. It can allow more efficient counting processes, it can uh, provide opportunities for, for citizens to participate uh, where they would not otherwise be able to. But obviously it also sits alongside lots of other issues, uh, potentially legal issues where electoral laws are often written many decades, perhaps even centuries ago. And also those issues of trust, ensuring that people uh, trust the technology that, that's been used at the same time. So today we've got three presentations um, looking at this issue of technology um, and elections. Uh, we'll begin in a moment with Tarun Chowdhury, who's also uh, from IFAS, who will give a presentation looking at demystifying uh, electoral cybersecurity. Uh, that will be followed by a second presentation uh, from uh, Brittany Hamzy, who will focus on the chain of harm applied research approach, strengthening information uh, integrity programming. Uh, and then we are very fortunate to also, to also have with us uh, Rafula Chibagati, uh, who is the former chairman of the Independent Electoral Boundaries Commission in Kenya, who obviously has extensive experience of actually running elections and using technology during the process as well. So we'll allow each presenter to go in turn uh, and then um, we'll have an opportunity for uh, questions um, uh, from the audience at the end. So uh, Tarun, delighted to give you the floor. Thank you. Let me share my screen here. Let me know if you can see that. All right, so uh, thank you, Toby. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about demystifying electoral cybersecurity. Um, so the title refers to uh, a series of briefings that IFIS uh, was asked to prepare by USA through the DAI Digital Frontiers Project. And the series of briefings is meant um, to help, USA wanted to introduce electoral cybersecurity to not only the democracy, human rights, uh, um, um, and governance officers or DRG officers and USA missions around the world, but to non-technical democracy professionals. So democracy professionals that might not have technical backgrounds, how do you begin to approach and understand electoral cyber security? And so with that in mind, I have developed a series of five briefings for which that you see on the screen that the final, um, the last one of which was formally released just a couple of weeks ago or um, last month. So what you see is a primer in cybersecurity and elections. And then there's a reference paper in which we de dive deeper um, into cybersecurity throughout the electoral process. And then we take a deep dive in, in uh, voter registration and another briefing results management. And it all culminates in a uh, electoral cybersecurity brief guide for donor program development. So if you are a donor agency, if you are a DRG officer, if you are a um, someone else that's involved in development aid, how do you actually go about developing um, electoral cybersecurity programs? So what I wanted to do today is to give you uh, some understanding of what is in the briefing series and also help develop this uh, um, topic of electoral cybersecurity with an eye towards introducing those who might not have a background in cybersecurity or not technically, uh, um, um, don't come from technical backgrounds, might be democracy professionals, might be working in elections, but really want to understand this topic area. So with that, hopefully I will get through uh, less than 15 minutes at this point. So what is cybersecurity, right? What are we talking about here? Um, so we're, we're talking about information, and particularly we're talking about electronic information. So information that is um, um, processed through electronic infrastructure, right? We're all familiar with that. We all have our cell phones, we all have computers. We're using Zoom right now. So information that is electronically mediated, what is that? You know, 
ideas, uh, um, um, anything uh, that's represented electronically, right? I think everybody in this day and age, at least, is probably com comfortable with that idea. So information is a sort of first principle of what, what, what does cybersecurity refer to? Well, it refers to this electronic information. But what can we do with that information, right? Um, we can store it. And everybody's also probably comfortable and familiar with this. We store information in our phones. We store information in our inform um, in, on hard drives, on our computers. We store information in that thing called the cloud, right? This information needs to be stored. Why does it need to be stored? Because we want to process on it. We want to, we want to run some sort of permutation. We want to change. We want to use it as part of a different process. So we can think about the electronically inf electronic information that one is stored somewhere, and then we also use it in some way. We process it through other information systems. And then of course, we need to transmit it, right? All these processes are happening right now as we use this the Zoom infrastructure for this virtual conference, right? This information that's being stored, is being processed, is being transmitted. So we're interested in the cyber part of cybersecurity we're talking about electronic information that's being stored, processed, or transmitted. How about the security part? So in terms of security, cybersecurity or information security professionals, computer science professionals for over the past 30 years have really thought about this. And they define, the just like they define the definitions of storage, processing, and transmission to describe this electronic information and what we do with it, we're also interested in the security of it. And one of the things that we're interested in is in the confidentiality. Right, we we want information to be used by those who should use it. We want to keep some information from some audiences and give other audiences access to information. So the confidentiality of the information is a dimension that we're really interested in. We're also interested in the integrity of that information. Right, is the information that we have, the information that we want unaltered? Has has someone given us the information that that that? has been altered in some way or is not the information that we want? How do we know that the information that we asked for from storage has arrived unchanged? We're interested in the integrity of that information. And then finally, we want that information to be available when we ask for it. So the availability of that information becomes really important. So when we think about this, then we can define cybersecurity, and I'm using the term very loosely here. If you were in undergraduate computer science or information management class, they would call this the um, security management, the information security management, the process of managing information security, right? We're worried about electronic information. We're worried about its confidentiality, availability, and integrity as it's being stored, processed, and transmitted. But then that begs the question, what levers, what tools do we have in order to manage those processes and to manage the security of these processes? Well, we have policies, right? We're all familiar with this. We all, we all have IT uh, departments who are the bane of our existence telling us what tools we can use, how we can use them, why we can use them when we shouldn't use them, right? Telling us to look out for suspicious emails, making us take training. So there's education, right? This technology is not being used in a vacuum. It's being used in a context of human beings, of social networks. It's being used in a context of sociopolitical culture. It's being used in the context of core democratic processes like elections. So we have policies and we have education in order to affect. Those are levers that we can use to manipulate in order to manage the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information. And finally, we have technology to apply, right? We can apply technology to this management process. We can do things like encrypting information at rest. So even if it's access, someone can't actually use it because it's, it's scrambled, it's encrypted. Okay? We have other technology that we can use. We have the black box that we can put on the network in order to record who is accessing the information and auditing. We can audit our policies. We can teach those that are involved from lay users all the way through the executives that are controlling the resources, the purse strings available for these processes. We can teach them all along that spectrum so that we're able to holistically manage electronic information and it, the confidentiality, availability, and integrity of it as it's being stored, processed, or transmitted using the levers of policy, technology, and education. So, 
this is a very well ensconced idea in, 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 in computer science and cybersecurity and computer engineering and information security management. In fact, it, it's kind of an antiquated view of it. There, there, there are newer um, frameworks that, that, that focuses on the triad of confidentiality and integrity information. Um, a lot of people use human factors instead of education to refer to this. And so you can think about confidentiality and integrity, integrity through the lenses of people, policy, and technology. But I like this older version because it brings it all together. And you can think about the holistic management of security, right, as the confidentiality and integrity of information, um, as it's being stored, processed, and transmitted pol through policies, education, technology, and all these dimensions inner, right? So the management of security is paying attention to all these dimensions in order to make sure or manage our security risks. Now, this might beg the question, hey, Tarun, you've uh, told us a little bit about cybersecurity, but this is about demystifies it. Demystified, um, demystifying cybersecurity and elections. So where are the elections in all this? Well, I suspect a lot of you are probably familiar with this diagram. I suspect a lot of you might actually sigh and roll your eyes at this diagram because it's kind of the bane of us professional uh, um, democracy professionals working in an election space. We often talk about the election cycle. I love this part of this talk every time I give it because I get to ask this question. I get asked. So we just talked a little bit about IT and elections and cybersecurity. Where is the information technology on this cycle? Right? This is a cycle that represents a number of processes and sub-processes and stakeholders when it comes to elections. Right? We those uh, Many of you might be familiar with the cycle of before an election, during an election, and then after an election, leading into the next election cycle? The answer to my question is very simply, the IT is all over the cycle, right? All these stakeholders, election management bodies, election managers have a share of the IT infrastructure, the information technology that we're interested in protecting that they manage, but there are other stakeholders that manage other pieces of information technology infrastructure. And there's information flows between and amongst these stakeholders and through all these processes as we are managing and executing elections. And so there's IT and increasingly IT of, throughout this whole process. And you can think of that information technology infrastructure all these computers that are slinging around these ones and zeros in order to make our lives or helping us execute elections, right? You can think of that as a tax surface. A tax surface is an industry term that says all the places in which someone that wanted to do something nefarious can get, can, can affect the electronic information that is you're interested in. Well, that is your attack surface. That is a tax surface that you're presenting. So protecting that attack surface then becomes holistically using that process of information security management that I just outlined becomes um, important. That's how we think about the uh, of IT across the election cycle. Now, we often get enamored with the election day processes, the, the voter machines, the ballot scanning machines, but there are a lot of other places. How about the day-to-day -day business operations of the election management body? Their ability to do their day-to-day -day work in planning the election, right? How about those processes? How about the results um, transmission system? How about the uh, system that feeds into voter registration, the, uh, um, um, the GIS systems that draw districts and then feed up through a ministry that might then flow that information to the EMB to generate the voter list? So then we can think of the election cycle, and then we can also think about how professionally IT is managed. Information technology is always often managed through these steps, from planning all the way to decommission and disposal. And everybody's kind of familiar with this. You buy a laptop and you use it for a time. The laptop gets security updates. It gets patches. You update the software on it. Then after a time, you dispose of it, right? You want to take your data off of it. So you can think of this as a cycle that after decommissioning starts with planning. Lining up the election cycle and the IT life cycle is sometimes difficult. It's often not lined up. 
That's one of the problems when it comes to managing cybersecurity. Do the election planning processes line up with how we manage the information technology? Perhaps the election planning cycle might be happening over a decade or so, and, and the technology life cycles might be happening in two year segments. What does that mean for cybersecurity? I want to run through the next couple of slides a little bit because I know that I'm down to my last four or five minutes of this presentation. But what you see in front of you is a generic voter registration process that starts with how you ingest the voter registration information, all the steps that you have to go through in order, order to clean it and then utilize it, and then utilize it through what you see on the right, a voting process, right? Matching the um, identity of someone with their voter registration, issuing them a ballot, having them vote, having them having a ballot return, and then checking, do I have as many finalized votes as I had ballots checked out and people check in? So all, all along this process, there's information technology in use. Well, how do we then secure it? Well, we have to identify the risks. The part of that risk is what I've already told you, the attack surface that, that the, um, the perhaps election management body for the IT infrastructure that is, comes under its purview, that it's managing, right? I know the attack surface, so that's part of this risk. But as I identify these risks, I have to categorize them in terms of what does it mean? If there's a, a compromise of confidentiality, integrity, or availability during this process, and it might mean different things for different times in the process. So I have to be able to know what that is. That way I can assign what we call a security control, an ability to manage it, and then feed that back into the process. Right? There are different types of controls. We can do things with people. We can institute policies or operational controls, right? So every time this process happens, two people have to do it. We there are technical controls, right? We can use technology and we can put those in place. So there are different forms of controls that we can use. But the other part of risk is who's out there trying to do something bad. So part of risk is knowing what am I presenting? What, where can people get into my systems? But the other part is who's trying to get in my systems? How are they doing that? So security controls are not only about the how how we utilize the technology but also thinking about how do i recognize and stop and recover after an attacker gets into my system so this is a simplified attack the attackers are looking to survey they're looking to how, how are they going to deliver the tools they're going to use they're looking to exploit a breach and then they're looking to do what they want to do and so at each of these stages you can think of security controls as being um, um, being uh, uh, organized in order to stop and recognize at each stage. Now, you know, when you think about who's out there trying to do what to you, and you think about what are my assets and what does it mean if something happens, well, that gets you to the very, very important part of risk. Risk is can be arbitrary, right? It's very hard to say, hey, this is how we should think about risk. And there are assumptions that have gone into how we did some risk rating in the primer. But you can change these assumptions and, this, and this, this whole thing will change. But the secret sauce here, the thing that I'm trying to get at, the thing that I want you to walk away from this presentation that I'll end in about one minute with, is that we as election professionals, election managers, should move from being ad hoc risk respondents to proactively managing risk. And what it means to proactively manage a risk is to think about what am I presenting? What is the infrastructure I have? What is the effect of, of, of some sort of um, breach of confidentiality, integrity, or availability um, to, to, to that infrastructure? And then how can I proactively start moving through it? Because once you get to that proactive, holistic risk management piece of it, I guarantee you that election professionals, election managers are going to resonate with that because they're already they're already risk managers in so many ways. Demystifying cybersecurity means integrating the information technology man management and the cybersecurity risk management into the risk management posture that's already going on. So um, the primer goes through a couple more things, builds a, a, builds a, um, builds a way to think through how can we address programming. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of content there that I won't go over today. but you can scan that QR code, read the whole briefing series. I hope what I've talked about is helpful today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you.
That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Torun, and uh, a really excellent presentation and really speaks to, I think, you know, the, the issue of risk management is so important to uh, elections and electoral integrity uh, over the past few years, as, as the pandemic has shown. So applying those principles to the technology of the cyber is really, really important. So thank you so much. So now we move on to our second presentation. Um, we're delighted to welcome Brittany Hamsey again from IFAS, who's going to talk to us about the, the chain of harm applied research approach. So Brittany, um, over to you to share your screen and the floor is yours. Yes, give me one second to share my screen and make it larger, hopefully. Okay, Is, can everybody see? Great. Um, wait, is this full screen? Okay, are you seeing it full screen? Because I'm not. Yep, we see that's full screen. Okay, perfect. <laughs> All right. Um, hello, everyone. It's great to be with you today. Um, my name is Brittany Hamsey. I am the Senior Information Integrity Officer on the Digital Democracy Team within IFAS's Center for Applied Research and Learning. Um, today, I'm going to be sharing with you uh, IFAS's Chain of Harm Applied Research Approach. Um, and focus on how it can be utilized to strengthen information integrity programming and hopefully thwart the, the threats that disinformation poses in the electoral system. Um, my colleague Tarun already talked about how to proactively manage risk in terms of cybersecurity. Um, and I hope today that I can help showcase um, how the chain of harm can be used to proactively manage risk in the information integrity space. Um, the community of implementers of information integrity programming currently lack a rigorous applied research approach uh, to understand differential experiences of marginalized groups in ways that increase the effectiveness of programming to counter disinformation, misinformation, and dangerous speech, um, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but I will just refer to as DMDS for the rest of this presentation. Um, the Chain of Harm works to provide a structure for the democracy and the human rights community to understand how DMDS really affects differential marginalized groups at each of the five stages of the chain, which I will go over, um, and how these insights can inform information integrity programming that strengthens the democratic information space and also protects the rights of marginalized groups. So what is the chain of harm applied research approach? Um, so central to the applied research approach are the stories and experiences of marginalized groups. Um, and this is told in our perspective through survey data and focus group findings. So the chain of harm depicts how coordinated disinformation campaigns intersect with and exploit existing identity-based tensions within a society. The applied research approach allows practitioners to map how DMDS affects underrepresented or traditionally marginalized groups at each stage of the chain of harm and allows them to identify potential intervention points where programming can disrupt or dampen risk. This is a depiction of the chain of harm. Um, before moving on to how to identify these information, these intervention points, I will first walk through the chain of harm. Um, as you can see, there are four discrete stages, which all lead to ultimate risk. Um, the first stage is the actor, which is a bit self-explanatory. It is the person or people producing hate speech, disinformation. The message itself is the hate speech or disinformation itself. It's that content or the information being shared. The mode of dissemination is how that message enters the world. Um, this could be a tweet, it could be a Facebook post, a newspaper article, a WhatsApp or a Telegram message. It can even be word of mouth, just any way that it is shared out into the world. The interpreter is the person who that message lands to. Um, so it's the person consuming that message. Ultimately, the person assigning weight, um, importance, or gauging its authenticity. And the risk, um, the risk is can be different depending on the the, the different um, contexts, but the risk is the result if there's no interruption of this chain. If disinformation or hate speech is allowed to run rampant, um, risk could be as widespread as anti-government violence or rampant distrust in the electoral systems, resulting in mass boycotts and distrust, um, or it can be as targeted as anti-marginalized community-based violence. Um, the chain of harm can be used to reveal meaningful insights that might otherwise be missed in a lot of DMDS programming, 
Um, for example, programming that addresses the differential impacts of DMDS often analyzes messages that target marginalized groups. But marginalized populations are also consumers or interpreters of these messages. The modes of dissemination by which these messages reach different groups vary um, depending on their social economic st statuses, where they live in the country, things like that. And the specific risks and harm for marginalized communities are just different. In some instances, marginalized groups might even be actors creating or spreading DMDS, either knowingly or unknowingly. And so the chain of harm can help practitioners and academics understand how each of these five stages impacts different communities, including people who identify with multiple social identities, such as women with disabilities or young people who are ethnic minorities. It's important to note that DMDS does not have to be equally neutralized at every single phase of the chain to be reducing risk, meaning that the chain of harm can help prioritize programmatic decisions to focus on the most impactful intervention points. And I think this is most concretely demonstrated through the program mapping workshop exercise that I'll talk about a bit more um, throughout this presentation. So there are multiple use cases um, for the chain of harm. I am highlighting three of them now. I will focus mostly on the program co-creation use today, um, and that's been the foundation of our two pilots for the applied research approach so far. So just to gloss over the other two, um, the chain of harm can be used uh, for DMDS and cybersecurity related threat modeling, um, especially as a way to distill larger threats into more discrete, smaller threats um, with more direct interventions. Um, and that it can also be a foundation to kind of map tactics, techniques, or procedures to help identify various threat actors, as well as inform how these defenses are constructed. As cyber threats affect marginalized communities in different ways, somewhere in some places disproportionately, the chain of harm, especially the co-creation lens, makes a useful participatory method, bringing these overlooked marginalized voices to the center of threat modeling, which is a place that they're not usually um, ingrained in already. Uh, the last is the chain of harm can also be utilized as an evaluative framework. Uh, it can be a helpful programmatic exercise to determine which indicators go with each node of the chain, which nodes are going to be most useful to target for a specific context. Practitioners can also easily see these impact gaps where they might be evaluating a project with a focus on a particular node, perhaps actor specific indicators. Um, but when they're mapping their results, they're not really seeing the information that they want um, or need. Um, and so then they are able to see that their monitoring and evaluation work may be more useful at a completely different node, um, perhaps pivoting more to mode of dissemination indicators. But as I stated earlier, I will be uh, focusing on the inclusive program co-creation, um, which is the basis of our two pilots. So the research methodology has been piloted in two countries so far, Iraq and Guyana, two vastly different contexts. Um, the first step in the methodology is creating specialized research questions that address each stage of the chain of harm. For example, the question, what groups or individuals do you see spreading DMDS focuses on the actor stage, whereas where have you encountered DMDS falls into the mode of dissemination. Uh, in Iraq and Guyana, we've piloted two different versions of collecting the survey data. In Iraq, we launched a full national survey interviewing respondents one-on-one. -on -one. It was very lengthy, very in-depth. I think each interview was at least 45 minutes. In Guyana, uh, several key research questions were added onto an existing survey um, that our in-country team was conducting for a separate project. So as designing and executing a national survey can be quite time consuming, as well as very cost prohibitive for a lot of uh, practitioners, the Guyana model can be more easily used um, and it still yielded sufficient data uh, for our uses, which I'll go and see, show how we use that data um, a little bit later in this presentation. The next phase in the programming were focus groups um, with marginalized communities to better understand the effects that DMDS were having on them directly. These focus groups were led by our community partner organizations in country. Um, the highlighted groups for our pilot purposes included um, in Iraq, it was women, religious minorities, and persons with disabilities. Um, in Guyana, it was persons with disabilities, youth aged 16 to 30, um, and indigenous community members. Um, just to note, persons with disabilities included those with physical disabilities, as well as those who are blind and deaf. 
These focus groups had about six to eight participants each to allow a sense of safety when talking about very heavily charged topics, um, such as disinformation. Um, these Groups started with a series of questions on media consumption before being shown case studies of two different pieces of disinformation without being told that they were untrue. Uh, they were asked to talk about their beliefs, how they might discern if the information was true or not true, um, whether or not they would share it if they saw it. They were then confronted with reality checks um, on the disinformation and uh, were asked how what made them believe or not believe the quote unquote truth. Finally, they were asked to share their experiences with dangerous speech um, and how they do or don't respond to that on a daily basis and how it does and does not affect their uh, civic engagement. Once all the data was gathered, we held the program mapping workshop. Um, so the program mapping workshop is an IFAS facilitated workshop uh, with our local community partners um, being the participants. So those same people who are running the focus groups were our participants for this workshop. Um, and it's really aimed at designing an inclusive, responsive programming uh, to use to collect data. Um, and then the using all of this collected data, the organizations um, really come together to identify places where their current programming does really well, um, as well as where there can be these gaps in the chain that um, additional programming and implementations could be really useful. Um, so the first part of the chain of harm workshop uh, is introducing participants to the chain of harm itself, just like I did to you all. Um, we used a similar tactic. Um, and then through a series of activities, really supporting uh, everyone in the room to start thinking about their own, their own programming um, through the lens of the framework. So through the participatory sections, um, the participants were able to build a deeper understanding of the chain of harm. Uh, and this included reviewing how disinformation, misinformation, dangerous speech are spread, amplified, interpreted, and how their programming interrupts the chain. Um, as the participants map their existing programming onto the chain by discrete activities, it allows them to see where they're working, um, it, to visually see, oh, most of my programming is directed at the actor, or, oh, we're really focusing on the mode of dissemination. Where are there gaps in our programming that could help us reach the goals that we want more easily? Um, and hopefully seeing these gaps and being confronted with it in real time um, can help spark a lot of brainstorming um, for how to fill them, which allows these participants to kind of break their established silos of thinking. They're like, oh no, we're really an actor-based organization when it turns out, actually, you're talking about more mode of dissemination or you're really talking about interpreters. It's like less of an actor, it's more of an interpretation. Um, so here's a larger uh, depiction of kind of how this mapped out. So for this particular workshop in Guyana, our partners were mostly working on message and mode of dissemination uh, activities, and there weren't very many actor or interpreter uh, programming activities in their wheelhouse currently. Um, as I will share earlier, the implementation ideas uh, that came out of this workshop really do fill those two empty silos. So how did we use all of the research that we gathered. Um, during the program mapping workshop, participants engaged directly with this research. We uh, gave out copies of the survey data. The focus group findings were available ahead. They were also printed and given on the table. Um, readout presentations were given by uh, the focus group leaders, as well as um, someone from our MEL team who was in charge of the survey. Uh, we held a lot of facilitated breakout sessions, having participants really key in on what are the interesting things that you saw in this data? What is happening? Um, writing them down, keeping them up, <laughs> making sure that we kept really making sure that every intervention was back to this data. Um, in Iraq, uh, that meant that the research findings showed that marginalized groups were really susceptible to DMDS and didn't know what to do about it. So the intervention was to train activists working with these communities how to, what to do about it. Um, about 100 people were trained through seven uh, workshops um, and highlighted groups included women, religious minorities, and those with disabilities. In Guyana, a really interesting research finding was that public, the public prefers face-to-face -face information gathering, um, but they don't seek it out. <laughs> and that older people are more confident that they can spot this information. What was really happening was that volunteers who were going out into the public to talk face-to-face -face with people were really confronted with disinformation narratives 
every day by their elders. Um, and a lot of these were youth volunteers who weren't not sure how to respectfully uh, counter message and fact check in real time. Um, so a lot of this is now being focused on that interpreter phase um, and how to respond in real time. Um, highlighted groups are including those with disabilities, youth, and Indigenous members. Um, the entire program mapping workshop has been uh, really focused on being inclusive, especially for our participants with disabilities. Um, all of the materials are been sent in advance. All materials are screen reader accessible. Everything includes alt text. Really making sure to use inclusive language. So instead of what do you see in the data, be like, what do you notice about the data that we've shown? Um, using dedicated note takers and sharing notes in real time was very helpful to us. Um, a lot of partner and group work to make sure that everyone is, is easily, um, has the ability to, to share their thoughts with the group. Um, we also had simultaneous interpretation um, into local languages, including sign language for some of our focus groups as well. And then uh, just to share with you about uh, what's happening with the Chain of Harm Applied Research Vote approach going forward. Um, there will be an update. There's a, a publication on IBIS's website if you look up the chain of harm um, that dates to 2019. Obviously, a lot has happened in the information integrity space since then, so we will have an updated publication um, with greater detail about our pilots um, and then a summary report um, of both the pilots in Guyana and Iraq. Uh, we will also be holding a dissemination event um, later in 2023. If you would like to be uh, up to date and stay informed, please feel free to email me and I can keep you um, abreast of all the details. So thank you so much for having me and please let me know if you have any, any questions in the chat. Brilliant. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you so much. And that really kind of nicely uh, kind of connects to the last presentation because in many ways uh, with technology, we're not kind of challenged with the technical side of things. It's also the very much the human side and our understandings of, of the systems and information uh, that we have. So thank you ever so much. Um, okay, so we now turn to our, our third pre presentation where we move particularly to focus on a particular country of, of Kenya, where we have Mr. Shikabati, um, who is the former chairman of the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission in Kenya. Uh, very fortunate to have him with us today to share his experiences and how he sees the role of technology in improving the integrity of the electoral process in Kenya. Um, over to you, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson of this session, um, for having me. My, my paper is on the role of technology in improving the integrity of the electoral process, and uh, particularly focusing on Kenya, where I served as the, the Chairperson of the Commission for a period of six years, which ended sometime this year. Uh, this paper is about the 2022 elections in Kenya, and in particular, uh, focusing on the transmission of the uh, tally uh, results. It analyzes the system we used, how it was implemented, and how it helped increase election integrity. The paper highlights the importance of speed, transparency, and auditability in making the tally reports publicly available and set a standard that can be applied to election practice in other countries in the region. Uh, transparency in elections uh, and all phases of the elections, and I, the previous speaker, uh, uh, Tarun, touched on the electoral cycle. It never stops uh, moving, but all that culminates into transmission of results. That is the scoreboard everybody uh, looks forward to, to seeing. And the, how we manage, AMPs manage results transmission is key to trust in the election outcomes. Uh, to achieve this, timely publication of election results is consequential. Delayed results give room for misinformation and disinformation. And I think Britain has touched on uh, the aspects of uh, disinformation and people are made to believe things which are not true. It's important to use transparent and efficient methods to make information uh, public. I, I looked at a report by International Idea, uh, which had carried out a research over 56 
it says that 56% of this information attacks target the voting period and especially transmission of results uh, period. This has that the international idea carried on uh, over 100 elections. So election management bodies then must invest heavily in this phase of the electoral uh, cycle. And excellent elections carried over the whole electoral cycle for, and you can prepare for five years. Everything can come to naught just because of results transmission. And this phase of results transmission is what I call in my paper, the last mile uh, test. Kenya has had a long history of contested results and electoral violence. In August 2022, when we had the general election, Kenya, however, held its most peaceful election in its history. And the reason is the way the IEBC handled the last mile test on results transmission. The result forms were published online immediately the election ended. All stakeholders were able to access the web portal that hosted results and the transmission rate was 99.9%. And these success factors uh, are many, but the most important is the deployment of the new end-to-end -end technology solution in results transmission, which we deployed. And also the tireless work of the IBC staff we had over 465, 660,000 staff who were involved in the exercise. And of course, the service providers, the telcos and the service providers involved in technology also did a commendable uh, job. The 2022 elections, like other elections in, in Kenya, also had its own, uh, they were challenged in court. We have had a history of elections being challenged and contested, and it, it, it's, it's, it's been like that in Kenya. It's a stop of Kenyan elections uh, since multi-party politics started in 1990s. Uh, uh, this normally is due to a negative ethnicity. We are a country of about 42 tribes, and there's a lot of uh, negative ethnicity. And also the system of government, we adopted after independence, uh, the first past the post, or uh, winner take all uh, electoral system. So in, in the previous years, 1992, 97, violence occurred uh, before elections. Uh, this involved displacement of population, so they don't vote in those particular elections. The years after 2007, 2013, and 2017, violence occurred after the elections. And the worst one was 2007, where 1,500 people died and 600,000 were displaced. However, in the 2022 general election, there was no violence before or after the elections. And uh, this happened because of the technology that we deployed. The elections were challenged in the Supreme Court, which is the court empowered to hear presidential elections according to the constitution. All the nine uh, grounds which were framed by the court uh, were dismissed and the court unanimously upheld the elections. In doing so, what the court did was a, a format scrutiny team, which was represented by all the parties, went through all the, uh, the, the servers of the commission, uh, ac had access to all the results we had, uh, uh, the commission had uh, generated and posted on the public portal and came up with a decision that uh, the electoral process was, was free, fair and credible and upheld the elections. What we have here on the screen now is Kenyan election in numbers. The, Electorate the population, the, the voters were 22 million 124.58. The staff involved in the elections 465,660. Uh, polling stations 46,229. And we deployed a KIMS kit for each polling station. KIMS is the Kenya Integrated Management System kit. I will explain it uh, uh, later. Uh, Kenya is a vast country, and the, these logistics then 
uh, very, very important. These numbers are very, very important uh, in, in uh, showing how the commission worked very hard to deliver this election. Candidates involved were 16,105 and the positions on ballot 1,882, which represents six elective positions. Voting is on the same day for all these six elective uh, positions. So the technology deployed, uh, we call it the Kenya Integrated Election Management System, is an end-to-end -end solution with the following components. It is a four-in-one, uh, it deals with voter registration, it deals with candidate registration management system, voter verification on uh, polling day, and the same uh, Kim's kit deals with results transmission. So for each polling station, we had one uh, Kim's kit to facilitate election day administration. And uh, from the average we took, each voter was taking about nine seconds uh, to be verified to vote. Uh, we also resourced our polling staff uh, with information and election intelligence. And uh, we monitored from the headquarters the elections the, the, the whole day. Now, the results transmission, as I said, is key. It is the last mile test. And IPC uh, tally reports for presidential elections. Uh, the law says all presidential elections, I mean, presidential election results must be electronically transmitted. And uh, we transmitted, processed, and transmitted these results in a quick and speedy manner. Uh, and the forms were scanned. Uh, we call it Form 34A, which contained correct and accurate data of results aligned to each polling station. Um, the target results were available to stakeholders and the public uh, to view. And this, we worked very well with the telecommunication service providers. And in a few areas where there's, there's no network, we had to bring in satellite modems, uh, which then gave us 99.9% .9 of the teleforms, which were uploaded within uh, 24 hours of closure of, of polls. So within 24 hours of closure of polls, all the data was on the public portal and everybody had access to this form that for is. Now, Form 34A is the primary form, where, which is uh, after polling at the polling station, the, the votes are counted, the agents uh, of the candidate sign, the presiding officer signs, uh, scans the form with the QR code, uh, which, is a, which identifies the returning uh, presiding officer, and uh, with a specific QR code for that particular polling station, and then sends the image to the public portal, also to the National Tallying Center and the Constituency uh, Tallying Center. And this is the first time we're using this innovation in the Kenyan politics. Uh, the QR code had a 15 digit sequence, which was then made it very difficult for anybody to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to interfere. And I, I think Britain has touched on, uh, both Britain and uh, uh, Tarun have touched on the security of uh, cyber security. Uh, our, our public portal, uh, working with the service providers, we made it in such a way that uh, nobody could be able to interfere with it. Uh, you have here on the screen the results transmission system, the movement from polling station to the back office and public portal and the, 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 the returning officer of the constituency. So that image is there. The, the tally of uh, presidential results uh, was therefore key to a uh, uh, peaceful election in 2022. The forms were submitted, transmitted as encrypted PDF files and automatically uploaded on the public portal. There was no human intervention in between. And as I said, 99.9% .9 of the tally reports were published within 24 hours of polls closing. At the end of the day, uh, during election period before announcement, 308 million hits were made to the presidential results from public portal. 
and the system remained intact. Uh, we kept it for three months before uh, decommissioning it. Having the results available, anybody could interact, download, add, and come up with their own uh, 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 solution or other with their own uh, candidate. Uh, this this engendered trust in the legitimacy of result. The fact that everybody could interact with the with the, the results. This matter of the elections ended up in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, after going through the evidence, had this to say, and I quote, the technology deployed by the IBC for the conduct of the 2022 general elections met the standards of integrity, verifiability, security, and transparency to guarantee accurate and verifiable results, end of quote. So the Supreme Court, was satisfied uh, that the technology deployed was of very, very high standards. Uh, Kenya's, in conclusion, let me say that Kenya's 2022 general election set a new culture of peaceful and legitimate elections. The driver was the changes IABC made in transmission of results. And the African Union and COMESA, among the many other observers, during the election said in their report, and I quote, as a result of the changes made to the results transmission system, the provision of presidential election results were publicly accessible on the IBC portal. The mission welcomes introducing these transparency measures to improve the integrity of the electoral process, end of quote. I thank you, and I thank you for this opportunity to share with you my experiences uh, at the commission during the 2022 general elections. Thank you. No, thank you very much for sharing, for your excellent presentation and for sharing your experience uh, and insights, which is as ever much uh, appreciated. Um, so I think next um, we do have a discussion. Um, we have Professor um, Nick Cheeseman, who's the Professor of Democracy at the University of Birmingham um, to share his general comments and reflections on the presentations. And then after that, what we'll do is we'll open uh, the session up for comments and questions uh, from the floor. So uh, Nick, um, over to you. Hi everyone, a uh, real pleasure to be here and to hear three excellent presentations. Thank you to all of the speakers. Um, I'll start last if that's okay and work my way back. Uh, so uh, lovely to hear, you know, the explanation of how Kenya's elections went well in 2022. And one of the things that the former chair uh, was a little bit modest about was, was in some ways his own role there. Uh, it was a very tense situation for those who didn't follow it closely for a while. Uh, there was an attempt to disrupt the count at the Bomas Tallying Center. The chair himself was actually assaulted in that process. And so I think there's also a story here about personal bravery and uh, the risks and the threats that electoral commissioners face in doing their job. And, and that should be noted before I talk about more technical issues. Um, I think the story of Kenya is a fascinating one, and it slightly changed my position on digital technology, having worked on Kenya for 10 years and ridden on Kenya in 2013, when I think it's fair to say that the technology didn't work. 2017, when it worked better, but it didn't work quite well enough to convince everyone. And then 2022, when it pretty much worked everywhere and it was the saving factor in the election, there's been a really significant uptick in the performance of digital technology. I think 2013 and 17, there were a lot of people who were saying, this is a very expensive technology. Is it ever going to work? Why is it failing to give us these completely sort of credible elections? After 2022, people are now starting to say, hey, this digital technology can be very effective. So my question for, for the chair, former chair, uh, is, uh, Mr. Chibakadi, you know, how did you make those improvements? Because, you know, 2013, for those who weren't there, the, the kits were found to have not worked by in most of the polling stations by the e-log observers. 
2017, the kits were seen to have worked most of the time, but some of the scans didn't come into the online portal. 2022, everything worked and all the scans came in. I think it would be really interesting to hear about how those improvements were made. Was it simply technical? Were there other things that happened? Somebody suggested to me that actually a lot of improvements were made between the first election in 2017, which was, of course, nullified by the Supreme Court, and the rerun election in 2017, and a lot of improvements were made in between those two. But I think it would be really interesting to hear what were the actual steps that were taken? How did you affect that improvement? Because, of course, there are a lot of other countries in Africa where the digital technology isn't working that well right now. Nigeria might be a good example of where a similar online portal didn't work as well as it did last time in Kenya. It'd be really interesting to know what are the lessons from Kenya that we can maybe export to Nigeria. Uh, the two IFIS presenters uh, presented very well. I enjoyed the talks. In terms of DSDM, GMGS, yeah, sorry, and, and the sort of impact of, of this and the process that you identified and articulated, um, by the nature of it, you got to spend more on the kind of setup and the analysis than the actual sort of solutions and the implementation of those at the end. And I wondered whether you might tell us a little bit more about that. One of the things that it strikes me is generally a challenge, and I've worked on election disinformation in a number of countries, um, is that it's often, you know, it's very time intensive to do this kind of work, right? The processes you were talking about, the focus groups, designing your questions per country, I endorse all of that. I think that's exactly what we need to do. But it is time intensive, and it is very context specific. And the two things that that often mitigates against is scaling up, and actually doing something at the kind of scale that it would affect the border election rather than a specific community with which which we're working. So I wondered if you could just take an opportunity to tell us a little bit more about how you work, and in particular, how you deal with those questions of scaling these things and actually having an effect at the kind of election scale and national scale, rather than each individual community. Um, and one question I sort of wanted to ask everybody in a way, is how they think we go about, um, you know, building public confidence and awareness of digital processes, because it seems to me that, especially with the digital technology introduced by electoral commissions, um, that on the one hand, this has given electoral commissions a tool that they didn't have before, but it's also introduced what Mike Yard, who many of you will know, kind of once called in one of his papers, a black box. It's something that's harder for citizens to understand. It's something that's sometimes harder for civil society groups and domestic monitors to observe. The digital processes, the servers, the actual parts of the machinery that contain the data. Um, and there's a risk, I think, that that alienates people in civil society groups from the electoral process rather than brings them further into it. Um, you know, a good example being that, you know, in successive elections in Kenya, as, as the former chair can attest, accusations that servers have been hacked or that Venezuelans somehow created false results on servers or that entire systems were kind of faked um, became one of the key topics of discussion. And so the digital technology became a big issue and was seen as kind of one of the issues that was sort of being controversial rather than resolving the control. Obviously, in many of those cases, I think those accusations have not been substantiated. As the former chair said, the Supreme Court completely validated the last election results and threw out most of the claims that were being made. But the fact that those claims had public resonance, I think, reflects the fact that this is still a technology that's not that well understood. And so people imagine that it would be possible to completely hack into the system and fabricate all of these results. And so one of the things I think we probably as a community need to really work on is bridging that gap between the technology and so on. So I, I congratulate um, IFIS in terms of actually trying to produce material for people outside of this specialized uh, environments. But I wonder whether or not we, you know, we need to think more about how we actually do that, and perhaps also about the ways in which electoral commissions themselves can actually communicate more effectively about that in terms of being able to explain to people how the technology works. So I'll leave it there. I want to leave lots of time for Q&A. Really enjoyed the conversation and the presentations, and hopefully that will raise at least a few thoughts for people uh, who are coming in after me. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Nick, for those uh, comments and suggestions and questions indeed. So what I suggest we do is we do a round robin of the presenters. Since Nick reversed the order, we'll go with that and allow each respondent to uh, return um, their own comments in response to that. And then we'll open it up for any questions from the floor. So 
Uh, Mr. Chakrabarty, do you want to respond to some of the points kind of raised there? Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I think uh, what Nick has uh, hit the nail on the head. Uh, it wasn't a uh, walk in the park in the 2022 elections. Uh, there were incidents of violence uh, here and there. Uh, but uh, the law provides that um, if anybody is aggrieved with an election, then they file a petition in the Supreme Court, which was done. And the Supreme Court went into all the necessary details, including scrutiny of the the, the technology and the, the, the election result forms and then dismissed the petitions. But back to the, 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 the primary issue of um, how did we do it differently in 2022? The previous years, uh, and particularly 2017, there were issues with the transmission of results. There were issues of transmission of results in 2013 general election. Lessons learned from previous elections then helped us plan better in 2022. What we did in 2022 is we said we are not transmitting the text message of the results from the polling stations. Because what happens when you transmit the text and then the results forms comes, there's always a problem between the text and the result forms. And then that creates room for misinformation and disinformation again. Uh, then people say uh, the words used in Kenya is that you are cooking the, the, the results. So what we said, we shall only transmit the image, the form. Uh, at the end of polling, uh, the presiding officer at the polling station, uh, we had 46,229 polling stations. So the presiding officer completes the form that 4A, which is polling station specific, uh, counts the results with the agents, completes the form with the results, signs it. The agents of the candidates also sign the form and are given copies of that form. And what the presiding officer then does is scan the form uh, on the Kim's kits and transmits it to the National Tiling Center the constituency tiling center and the public portal at the, the same time. The image is captured on an, an encrypted digital uh, PDF format using the, 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 the device, the Kim's device. And then the PDF is what is uh, sent to the public uh, portal. And uh, the security feature here then is uh, each each officer, each presiding officer, uh, the, the, each, sorry, each form, each form that 4A has a QR code specific to that polling station. So you cannot transmit this uh, form from another device or from another polling station. And uh, that's what we did differently. We created a QR code, a 15 digit QR code, code for each polling station and uh, gave the the rights to the specific uh, station to the uh, presiding officer so that he can be biometrically identified before he scans and sends the image. So it was not easy to get another uh, form from another place other than that polling station. And each of these forms could then be traced to that uh, polling station. And that's what we did differently in previous years. We were having mes uh, text messages of results being sent forms coming and they were all having variances and then it, it created lots of uh, uh, lots of problems. And so this is uh, uh, what we did differently. Uh, we had not done it before and it worked very well that all the forms were uploaded on the public portal, everybody engaged with them. And even the forms we generated uh, at constituency level called that 4B, which are for the 290 constituencies were also uploaded on the public portal. And the form that 4C, which is the summation of form that 4A's, all the 46,229 forms, giving the result of presidential candidate, was also uploaded on the public portal. So at the end of the day, this information was available for everybody to see. But that, of course, doesn't stop the, the misinformation. And uh, we have cases where even attempts were made to 
to, to, to alter the, the, the forms uh, by some individuals uh, to, to show that the results are different. But the forms, the commission has the, the results. It will keep them for the next three years. And uh, anybody who wishes to interact with them is free to, to engage the commission. Right. Uh, and so for countries in the region, I think they, I would urge them to, 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 to come to Kenya and learn how we did it, because I believe it's the way to go. Uh, thank you very much. Thank I you. hope I've uh, uh, given shed some light on uh, uh, how we did it differently. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, so we should slide the other respondents just to come back to those questions, um, and then we'll gather it together any other, any other questions from the floor. So Brittany Hamza. Yes, um, you're you're right. <laughs> the the issue of scaling up is kind of hard. This is a very intensive project, um, and it really does is the linchpin of this is a lot of intensive research. Um, but a lot of these interventions are really meant to to scale and to kind of be that larger dissemination phase. So um, one of the interventions that I didn't mention for lack of time um, in Guyana is a using like a hype house model um, of influencers. So really for like greater media literacy um, campaigning. So really utilizing, leveraging existing networks that exist, um, that people are engaged in already, really making sure that even if you're really just watching an influencer on TikTok or Instagram because you like that they bake a lot of cookies. Um, sometimes they're gonna bake those cookies and they're gonna teach you about mis and disinformation um, and how to identify that. And so we're kind of training that, um, that group of really influential Guyanese um, social media stars um, to try to flip the script and, and make sure that people can kind of are confronted with this on a more daily basis. Um, and utilizing those large followings. Uh, additionally, in Iraq, yes, we only trained uh, 101 people in the implementation, but very nicely, a lot of those who were trained are educators. Um, a lot of the women are are in the classroom every day, um, and a lot of them wrote to us afterwards saying, oh, I really, I've incorporated this into my lesson plans. Um, I'm trying to get uh, my my high schoolers to, to think more about this. So it's not necessarily going to be an, an instant, a lot of this is behavioral change, right? So a lot of this isn't going to be instant, like I am a master at identifying mis and disinformation row. Um, so I'm going to spread it to others. Actually, we found really interesting results um, in our pre and post tests for Iraq for these uh, trainings that people were really confident going in before this training that they could identify mis and disinformation and that they would know that they would not be tricked. Um, and it turned out actually the scores went down after the um, the trainings to be like, oh, maybe I'm not as good as identifying this as I thought that I was. Um, so that also kind of makes people do more double takes, right? Makes them want to realize that their own um, that their own misgivings. They need to kind of work on that. That there's there's broader societal change um, that is harder to track. These pilots, um, the Iraq pilot only ended um, about five months ago. Um, and the Guyana program mapping workshop happened in May. So these are still really new pilots. We're still working to kind of gather more of that long-term data, um, but that's really something that we're actively trying to, to track and, and really try and make sure that this is as scalable and, and but the, scalable with the eye that everything is still needs to be very context specific because of this type of program. Hopefully that answered your question. It does. Thank you so much. Um, and Tarun, do you want to come back on those in, in response yeah. to that? So uh, Nick, thank you. You framed your question by uh, um, quoting Mr. Michael Yard. And I should tell you that Mr. Michael Yard was actually a co-author on the culminating uh, um, um, brief, briefing in the series, the programming guide, right? Um, so the, the short answer to your question is that there, there are no quick and easy answers, right? But at the same time, the, uh, the antecedents of how I would answer that question are already embedded in how I spoke of cybersecurity, which is to say that this isn't something for specialists to think about in a vacuum. This is something for you to think about in the holistic sense, right? And so when you talk about those tools in terms of cybersecurity of, of uh, um, 
policy technology and education, that policy piece and the education piece become very, very important. So if we're applying cybersecurity to the world of elections, and as you rightly say, as we use technology, we run the risk of, of making uh, the election even more opaque and less transparent and harder to understand. So what we have to do then is lean heavily on that policy piece and importantly, that education piece. And when you put it in that context, what you might realize from election management point of view is that voter education and strategic communication becomes a strategic necessity and a security concern that you have to devote resources to. So where that gets us is that maybe we need to think about reprioritizing the resources available and perhaps creating even more resources available in order to do that education piece, in order to make people more comfortable with that black box. Um, and, and that's not unique to elections, but what is unique to elections is something that the cybersecurity specialists don't always think about, but is that piece of trust, right? One of the things that you realize when you look in at, let's say, internet voting and, uh, um, and, and uh, cybersecurity, why are some countries, i.e. Estonia, able to accomplish internet voting and why can't other countries not do it? Well, there is a level of trust in the national ID system, amongst other things, that allows the public to have a level and degree of confidence, right? In order to get there, if you want to use internet voting in your country, one of the dimensions that you have to think about is how am I going to bring the public along to create the necessary trust in order for them to view this process as having a high level of integrity? So the answer is messy, but the answer is the holistic approach in which you're able to introduce incremental technological change and bring the public along for that ride and build their trust in the system is the messy answer. <laughs>